it's a great pleasure to come back to APS. And uh, thanks, John, you know, giving this opportunity, the first speaker for this year. And I feel really like home. It's warm now. <laughs> so today, I'm going to talk about uh, basically, you know, the ultra-fast science uh, based on uh, accelerator technology, you know, for the castle of guns. So the title of my talk is uh, Making Atomic and uh, Molecular Movie with MEV Electrons. And uh, here's are the three examples of the so-called movies I'm going to talk about uh, today. The first one is uh, basically a 2D model disulfur, 2D materials. This one's use the laser to hit, you see the distortions. And here you demonstrate you can use a laser to deform, to control the, you know, the 2D material, which uh, will change its electrical optical properties. So second one is uh, you know, this uh, new class of uh, solar materials, it's a hybrid price gap. And uh, here we using ultrafine electron, we can show after the light exciting, and you see there's only local distortion of the, you know, the iodines around the lead. So you have this rotational you know, movement. And the last, not the least, is one of these uh, you know, famous uh, CHD you know, molecules and uh, with uh, UV light, you can ring opening. So, you know, there's a lot of talk about, um, you know, movies. And uh, definitely here, I'm not talking about traditional, you know, you have hours movie. We are more like a talk frames. And, uh, you know, you're hitting the molecule with the light. You see the structure change. You take a picture. The next time hitting again, you delay to another time frame. So you more like take a series of uh, frame of pictures that you try to put together as a movie. And uh, you can see here is a commentary about the current technology development from the laser-based, uh, you know, microscopies, and uh, basically to make atomic, uh, you know, a molecule movie, you need two things. First, you need a spatial resolution. You can see the molecule structure. That means sub amstrons you know, picometers. Then you see the time, because all this basic change happen around the 100 femtosecond time frame. So those are the basic requirements on your technology. You need a spatial resolution, you need a temporal resolutions. And uh, so here is uh, basically the scale. And you basically, to look at atomic, you need, uh, like I said, you know, picometers, 100 femtoseconds. So among the many, you know, technologies, there, you know, in this uh, commentary, at the, you know, physics, we found about like a more than a year ago when we published our first, uh, you know, iodine, you know, coherent uh, iodine molecule oscillation. They point out two technologies, so ultra-fast X-ray and uh, ultra-fast electron standing out. That's because these two technologies simultaneously possess both spatial temporal resonance need to make molecule movies. Furthermore, this come to point out, uh, as we know, is uh, with these two technologies, you get a structure directly. You use, uh, you know, optical spectroscopy, spectroscopy techniques. You need some kind of model and, uh, you know, to interpret data. So this is a direct. So this is one of the, you know, most powerful tools to make molecule movies, these tools. So here is a slide, you know, I copy from here, Argon's, you know, the lecture note. You know, this is, a, you know, we know X-ray and the electron are complementary, complementary. So X-ray is really look at where the electron around atom is. When the electrons look at the, where the nuclear, you know, is. So this is, a, you know, they are really look at the different aspect. And the X-ray have the chemical selectivity, and, uh, but the electron have much large cross sections. So they are really, you know, two complementary tools to look at is uh, make uh, molecular movies. For the, you know, when you try to study chemical reactions, because they are not only involve exchange of the electron, you also exchange the nuclear movement and the proton. So sometimes electron give you more information, can really follow the nuclear wave pack, you know, a long times. So let's, uh, you know, look at the electron-based technology. This is, uh, you know, one of the graphics show the history of the you know, microscope as a function of time. As you can see, 
you know, long time ago with the invention of optical microscope, people soon reached the resolution limit. That's because of the wavelengths. So with the discovery of the quantum mechanics, in 1930, the Raska realized you can make microscope with electrons because it has an extremely you know, short wavelengths. And since you know, last century, 1930s, in the last 80 years, you can see there's a, you know, three or four order of magnitude improve on the spatial resolution of electron-based techniques. I really want to point out those improvements really based three technologies. First is electron sources. You know, they starting with the semi-ionic gun, which introduced the, like a few emitters, cold field emitters. So that's one of the technology have been driving the development of the electron mosques. The second is energies. This is very much similar like to X-ray electron laser. We know the source determined and the emittance determined wavelength. And go to high energy, you can go to shorter wavelengths. Here, very similar. When they, starting with 75 kV, people reached the atomic resolution with the mega EV electron microscope in 19, you know, 80s, late 1980s. So the last thing is very familiar to our exergophys. It's the lattice. They call the aberration correct optics. That's last 20 years by introducing the aberration corrections. Now with the low energy, you can reach the you know, you know, half Armstrong atomic spatial resolution. So I would say electron microscope have you know, reached the wonderful spatial resolution. What amazing is time pro. And uh, we know everything is moving in the world. So the technology really introduced in early 1980s when Jerome Rowe in the University of Rochester, he modified a 20 kV street camera. Basically, he replaced this uh, street camera with a frequency quadro yag lasers. And he produced about a 10 to 20 picosecond electron pulses. And uh, he used this to first time study the aluminum melting. And before you, you know, heating it, then you can melt it. So they achieve a temperature resolution 20 picosecond. So this is really, I would call the start of the modern ultra-fast electron scattering. This is also first time, I believe, people look at using laser to produce electron beam. So this is the same technology now drive the photocastle RF gun for the actual FELs. So since then, what happened in the ultra-fast electron different? They starting with 20 you know, to 50 keV. People have been pushing to high energies. Three things happened. First, laser technology. Instead of a YAG laser and uh, with about 20, 10 picosecond, now you have Thai sapphire can produce uh, you know, fendosecond, five to 100 fendosecond. So laser technology. And the second is electron sources. People have been you know, optimized to get a better electron source, go to high energies. And the last not least is the detector, computing, and the data analysis. So with these three major developments in the last 20 years, group in Caltech, University of Toronto, and many other groups have been pushing the temporal resolution of electron defect based on the DC gun from a 10 picosecond to sub picosecond. And uh, so they can use this technology to study a lot of different uh, you know, physics and from the gas phase to strongly corded systems. And uh, so this is a slide that you know, summarizes what kind of problem they have been addressed with the DC guns. But one of the issues is uh, due to the strong space charge effect and uh, the temporal resolution of the so-called DC gun or low energy below 100 keV have been limited to about a you know, couple hundred sub-picosecond. And for the gas phase have been limited to you know, even picosecond due to so-called velocity mismatches. So as an accelerator physicist, we know how to overcome this space charge to reduce space charge. That's basically a photocastle RF gun go to high energies. And, uh, about 20 years ago, I did an experiment. And in that experiment, we produced about like a couple hundred femtosecond pulse with about 40 picocoulomb charges. And uh, 
So that time I was working on the free electron laser. And uh, for that time, you, as you people remember, people talk about the nominal performance requirement for the free electron laser is a one nanocoulomb, one millimeter millirating emittance. So this is too low. So when you look at the diffraction, people talk about picocoulomb. So that's where we starting to talk about possibility to use a photocastle RF gun. And there's a several issues people talk about is, uh, one is uh, they understand, yes, you can get it in the temporary. So how about the beam quality? Whether you have sample damage, whether you can mix work. So basically there's a, you know, issue whether this can work. The, the people raise this question because uh, there's a MEV electron microscope and uh, they have been, you know, mainly in Germany, Japan, this country, and now I think only Germany and uh, Japan have this uh, MEV. They are very large. You know, you can see this uh, human being usually tends to be expensive. So you talk about MEV, people always say, that, oh, yeah, we've done that, uh, and the sample damage and uh, the, you know, signal noise to ratio is not good. So what we try to say is that we'll replace this, uh, you know, huge and DC electron source with this, this 10 centimeter you know, one half cell photocastle RF guns. And uh, the technology with the photocastle is very much similar like a force photo electron source, Gerard Moreau did it. We use a laser to control the electron beams, uh, tempo, spatial res you know, distributions. And uh, we take the advantage of the accelerator technology to accelerate the beam as fast as possible to higher energies. That's because one electron stationary, they don't like to stay together. They have a repulsive cooling forces. When they move, they have a magnet field and they have tractions. So this you get a one over you know, gamma square reductions in the space charge. So basically, this telling you is the most efficient way to reduce space charge is to go to high energy as fast as possible. So that's where we starting the discussion. But there's other issues. Is besides improved temporal resolution, is there any other benefit? In the electron micro, there's a MEV allow you to handle thicker samples. And uh, this is uh, really important uh, in the, to study physics because uh, one of the bottleneck with the current DC gun based UED is the sample. So with uh, MEV, we can handle from 20 nanometer up to a couple hundred nanometer thick samples. So the, also it's uh, because of the high energy and uh, you have uh, less multiple scattering. And uh, this will allow you to do quantity, not just qualitative comparison between the experiment and the theory to easily to interpret the physics. And uh, so here's the example comparison. This is uh, one of the, you know, so-called the Debye Waller effect. And uh, look at the 20 nanometer uh, gold with uh, 30 keV. And here's the experiment result data at the slack with the 30 nanometer with the 4 MeV. As you can see, theory, if without multiple scattering, you're supposed to go to zero. Because of multiple scattering, low energy, you cannot. So here demonstrate with, uh, you know, MeV, you get a better quantity comparison. For study like a gas phase, because this is a, one of the unique thing about the electron diffraction is the study dilute sample because it have a large scattering cross sections. So with, uh, you know, dilute some urea gas, they are really large, like a couple hundred micron six. And when you have a pump, for example, move in the speed of light, you have electron with a 60 kV move less than half in you know, the speed of light. So they have, you know, so-called velocity mass. This is what we call the slippage in the free electron lasers. So this with like a, you know, gas phase, even you have, a, you know, very, very short electron pulse, you are limited to about like a, you know, picosecond time resolution. With MEV, you can basically completely eliminate this kind of, you know, time resolution limit. So with, uh, you know, last 10 things, I give you a brief introduction why we are going to MEV. So in the rest of talk, 
I'm trying to give you what kind of you know, program Slack try to develop. And I will give you a couple of science examples. Look at some material science experiment that we have performed, photochemistry, and a couple we use both electron diffraction, XFELs to address some you know, unique physics questions. And the focusing of this talk, I want to show you with the temporal spatial resolution, we can make atomic movie to the, basically the first movie to look at the, how the photomaterial behavior while you have light heating, why it's more efficient. And uh, then we'll look at the two of the chemicals and one is so-called this, uh, you know, saccharine hexidine CHD to look at the ring opening and uh, look at the bond breaking. So if time allowed, I will give you a little bit of outlook of what kind of R&D in the future in the UEM. So in about, you know, 2014, about like, you know, four years ago, DOE have a workshop called the Future of Electron Scattering Diffraction. So in this workshop, DOE identified ultra-fast electron scattering instrument is an area DOE should get involved to help move the frontier of this technology. So in response to this uh, workshop, Slack launched a so-called ultra-fast electron and microscopy initiative. The goal of this workshop initiative was to, to complement basically you know, x-rays and uh, to access uh, basically ultra-fast and ultra-small world. And uh, here's the roadmap and we lay out uh, about uh, four years ago. We will start with a so-called relatively simple you know, ultra-fast electron diffraction based on the MEV because we would like to have, a, you know, breaks 100 femtosecond, you know, time barrier for the ultra-fast electron diffraction. And from there, we go to so-called nano UEDs. And uh, basically, as you know, the electron scattering is a kind of average. You don't have the local, you know, informations. So by go to reduce the probe size to a 10 nanometer, you could get the local informations. And uh, here we will go to like from here, it's about like 100 hertz to kilohertz, maybe megahertz. Then next step, we would like to go to directly like imaging in real space. And uh, we look at it around, we believe the superconducting RFCON based technology, which provide the stability you need to achieve atomic resolution and, uh, you know, Sub nanometer, sub nanosecond temporal resolutions. So this, you know, kind of roadmap, and uh, here's the timeline. We have, uh, you know, implemented this uh, roadmap. We starting the project in the April, you know, to, for the MEV. We first clean the space, and uh, then we, you know, install the laser optical table that we use one of the LCL spare guns as our electron sources. So we collaborating with, uh, you know, our user community, developed the, you know, electron sample, uh, the sample chambers, and uh, we developed a phosphor-based uh, detectors. So in about uh, six months in August, we have a first beam, and uh, we did the first experiment in the first week of September, and in, uh, you know, in the last uh, three, four years, we have been, you know, engaging with, uh, you know, user ultra-fast communities. So here is show, you know, we have a science workshop uh, in October last year, and we have now growing, you know, communities. So this is a slide, give you a, you know, scale of the device I'm discussed. Here is electron source, and here are sample chambers. In between, we have a basic electron beam diagnostic and uh, basically a vacuum differential pumping because uh, RF gun have 10 to minus 10. The sample chamber with the gas is uh, 10 to minus 4. So we have uh, six order module differential pumping. And uh, because high energy, we have a relative long, three and a half meter long camera lens. So total device about five meters. So currently the device can be operating with a single shot to 180 hertz. And uh, with a temporal resolution about 100 femtosecond full width half maximum. 
and the normalized emittance about 2 to 20 nanometer depends on the charge. And uh, so we have a Q resolution about, uh, you know, 0.07, you know, amateur inverse ion strong. And this is a show one of the, you know, fast melting of the strongly cold system. So one of the recent development is uh, we have uh, developed terahertz use uh, both as a pump source for the ultrafast experiment, also for the diagnostic. Here we show, you know, basically we move the terahertz delay, we can use the terahertz as a street camera to measure the electron beam bunch lines and the timing jitter. And uh, this plot show with uh, our current terahertz, we can basically have a temporal resolution, sub femtosecond. So this is a really powerful tool in the last uh, you know, couple of months to help us to further optimize the performance of the UED and uh, also provide a tool for future so we can reduce our the temporal resolution for current 100 femtosecond down to 10 to 20 femtosecond. So like I mentioned, we build device, and uh, here is a, a list of, I call the Chinese menu of the material we have studied. One of the first material is a so-called so nanostructure, different layer, try to look at the heat transfer. So by using, take advantage of MEV electron beam, you have less multiple scattering. You can study different layer and you can get a heat transfer. And we also study, you know, 2D material. And this is one of the, you know, main focusing current at the slag MEV UED because electrons have a large scattering cross-section. We also look at different quantum materials. And one of the things that we also develop is this single shot. With high electron beam energies, you can basically package more electron into a, you know, small, you know, temporal bunch. And this allows you to do single shot to study so-called irreversible size, mainly warm dense matter physics. And uh, we using the MEVUED first, you know, demonstrate that we can observe basically the different material melting regime from, you know, hydrogenous to, you know, homogeneous uh, melting regime transitions. So, like I mentioned, the first experiment we did is this 2D material. And uh, with this experiment, we demonstrated that MEV does have the signal to noise ratio to study one of the most you know, challenging you know, material, it's 2D materials. And uh, the next thing we study is the single crystal gold. And uh, as you can see, when we do the, there's a lot of Brock peaks. When you talk to material science, most people say Brock peak is boring. And as I survey, we saw the really exciting, really beautiful. Turn out what the really interesting physics is between the Brock peak. That's uh, where the, all the phonons, diffuse getting, you know, dynamics process. We demonstrate with the MEV electron beam, because they have less scattering, you could to study the diffuse scattering. Here we show with a goat, we can you know, look at the between the Brock peak, you know, different branch of the phonon developed dynamics. And this now has been used you know, to study strongly corded system, for example, cuprate, to look at the heat transfer from the different phonon mode to the, you know, uh, from the uh, acoustic, from optical phonon mode to acoustic phonon mode. And the last thing, like I said, it's, I want to show you is a, this a single shot capability we have been developing. It's a, here you can see we have a crystal, single crystal gold. And uh, with each shot, there are crystal melt. You start in ring. This is a, of the, you know, the signature of the liquid. Like I mentioned, this is the first time we'll be able to use MEV to observe from hydrogenous to homogeneous melting transitions. One of the latest experiments we just uh, you know, performed a month ago is uh, to study this uh, charge density of tannerite disulfide. And uh, one thing we look at is uh, you, because with uh, electron diffraction, you have a large Q range, you can simultaneously basically look at the Brock peak and the, the Brock peak around the superlattice. 
this is you know, indicator of different charge density waves. We will be able, with the current temporal resolution, we can look at this Brock peak and all these uh, super lattice oscillations. So this is the first time we can see the coherent energy exchange between the Bragg peak and the super lattice. And uh, so show we have a, this is a, with the oscillate friction, you know, 2.5 terahertz. We have a both temporal resolution and the sensitivity about, uh, you know, half percent. So besides the materials, you know, science, we have uh, studied a lot of these uh, so-called gas phase UEDs. And the people always say, you know, why you want to study gas phase? It's a simpler system, and uh, it really allows you to directly study the focusing on the simple physics in, instead of the environment. And uh, so you can really do a good comparison with other experiment techniques. And the really most important, because it's a simple system, no background, you can compare with the simulation theoretical models and uh, validate the you know, theoretical model. I'll show you some examples. And uh, the first two systems we study, one is this uh, nitrogen. Basically, in this experiment, we use an uh, ultra-fast laser shining on the nitrogen molecules, and uh, either the electrical field of the nitrogen, uh, the laser nitrogen aligned. So this is a classical, you know, if now. But once laser disappeared, they have a so-called uh, you know, revival. This is a complete quantum phenomenon. Their revival have a period about eight picoseconds. So with the electron diffraction, we will be able to demonstrate with this uh, simple system, we have a temporal resolution about 100 femtosecond. Spatial resolution is uh, better than, you know, 0.1, you know, Armstrong's. With the second experiment, we look at the iodine molecule, basically, you excite the iodine from the ground state to the excited state, you see they are coherent oscillations. So they are, have a coherent oscillation about a 400, you know, femtosecond period. We can complete the map out. So these two experiments, it's really give us confidence we have the temporal speed resolution. Since then, we have studied a class of the, you know, so-called photochemistries we look at the photo dissociation based on the bond breaking of the CF3I and the two molecules. And uh, we have been, you know, expanding our collaboration from our University League in Nebraska to the, you know, the British and uh, uh, to a German university and, uh, you know, York universities. So basically, as you can see, we have looked at, you know, generally a class, you know, the major you know, photochemistry reaction from the bond breaking, ring opening, to the, you know, more complex, the, you know, Rome reactions. So, you know, this is the kind of class that we are doing. So, for the rest of the next, you know, 20 minutes, I'll discuss, you know, a little more detail how we can make molecular movies. Since, uh, as you know, all the diffraction is in the reciprocal space. So movie we talk about is uh, in real space. So one of the key technique we use is called a PDF pair, you know, density distributions. And uh, so which allow us to transform from the reciprocal space to real space, make a picture, make movies. And uh, to do that, you need your system have uh, the spatial resolution and the Q range. And the electron diffraction, I believe, at the ultra-fast is uniquely positioned. So here's uh, one of the nice classical pictures of the famous picture by Van Gauss, and you have a shine sign. And, and uh, you know, the first example is, uh, if this is a modern house, the roof will be a solar, you know, panels. And uh, so people are really exciting to understand, you know, beyond the silicon, what kind of, you know, solar panel you can use. And uh, turn out uh, one of the really exciting thing is uh, this uh, periscope, and uh, you can see in about the last you know seven years, the efficiency from like a you know very cut percent to 22 percent. This is uh, you know already competitive with uh, silicon, but the technology to make this kind of 
solar materials are much cheaper. And that, but there's a very fundamental physics why these things are uh, you know, so efficient and uh, how you, know, you can control to make it more efficient. So to understand that you know, basic, the first step when you have a light heating this material, how they convert it into electricity. So there's a lot of spectroscopy technique and uh, to believe there's a coupling between the structure of the lattice to the hard carrier of the electrons. All those are the indirect. Here, we try to use the electron diffraction directly observe this coupling. So here's our experimental setup. Basically, we have a optical light and uh, we have been using like 400. We also have an OPA tune up to 700 nanometers to exciting the samples. Then we have a 3.7 MeV electrons. And here we have detector, look at this ring struct diffraction patterns. And the first thing we observe is uh, we found out once this excite, there's a very uniform the lattice distortion. Here show if you have a 400 nanometer, you have a different rings. They have a, all this change of the intensity of this diffraction ring have the same time constant. So there's a very uniform the distortion of the lattice with uh, you know, the photo absorptions. And the second thing is uh, we tune the pump laser to about a seven 100 nanometers, just below the you know, exciting gaps, then we see the basically zero distortions. So from this, we know it's not the heat caused this uh, lattice distortion. It's the coupling of the hot carrier in the deal. So this is the first time directly observe the, you know, the conversion of the light to the electricity is due to the lattice distortion. The second thing is uh, we try to look at how this light distortion you know, happens. So basically, we integrate these rings and we get this uh, radio distribution of the diffraction ring at the reciprocal space as the inverse Armstrongs. And uh, this show, as you can see, at a different time, you know, before the time zero, and uh, five pico, 10 picosecond, you see of the, this uh, different ring change with times. And uh, so with uh, these kind of rings, we use this uh, PDF, we can convert it into real space, basically a simple Fourier transform. One of the really interesting things uh, we look at this uh, signal is uh, at a different time, you see at a certain distance, for example, at a four and a half Armstrong, this corresponding to iodine, iodine, uh, you know, the bond lens. And, uh, you know, this is, a, you know, change. Rest of it, you see, there are very little changes. So when we look at the, you know, the structure change, we notice there's a, basically, the distance between the, the iodine, iodine is no change. It's only the distance between the lead and iodine change. So from this kind of, you know, the individual frame of the diffraction pattern to real space transfer, we get such a picture. Basically, you see you have this, uh, you know, iodine rotating around with the lead. So this is, uh, you know, the first time people directly look at the why, you know, what's the role of the lead and the iodine, you know, what kind of role they perform to converting the light to the electricity. So this is a, you know, atomic wave. You know, as we look at the, you have a sun, you have a basically, you know, photoinsides, this biosis, and you have visions, this involves the ultrafast, so-called isomerization of your, you know, eyes. So that's how you detect the light, not converting into the heat. So this all involves the, you know, ultrafast chemical process. So we would like to, using the MEV UDs to study, you know, this kind of process. The starting point is basically vitamin D. So in the vitamin D, as you know, when you have light, when you shine the light, you open the rings, 
and that's how you produce the, you know, the vitamin Ds. So this is you know, one of the things that you try to understand one of the fundamental bioprocess uh, you, know, you need to basically study the ring opening. And uh, so the system we look at is this uh, you know, CHD molecules. The reason we choose this molecule because uh, why it's uh, you know, the ring opening it's converting into so-called, um, you know, the <clears throat> high strain HT. You know, they have a, instead a single bond, they have a double bonds. And uh, so this is, you know, one of the simple things we want to look at how the fast bond breaking. So another thing we have been looking at is uh, what kind of study have been done with the CHD. People have been using the, you know, spectroscopy techniques and uh, even using the XFLs. They basically, you know, Using UV light, you get the ring openings. And uh, so because of spatial resolution limit, most of people indirectly to observe of the ring opening. So we believe with UED, we can directly observe this uh, ring opening. But the most more, the more important is uh, because after the ring opening, this molecule is going to move along so the you know, energy surface, uh, you know, go through these so-called uh, canonical intersections. And uh, they go back to this called the uh, ground state. And uh, there's a dynamics, continued development, the structures, and how this uh, you know, final ground state will end up. So we, with the UED, we not only can observe the initial ring opening, we can also study the ground state dynamics of the product of this ring opening. And that's really the fundamentally to understand how the you know, ring opening affects the chemical, physical property. So turn out the, the technique we use to study the gas phase is very similar we discussed to study this, you know, Perovskite, you know, these uh, solar cells. Basically, we have uh, diffraction rings, and uh, we convert to radio distributions. Because uh, one of the techniques developed at the Zwell group is, uh, since the gas phase signal is very weak, so you must do some, you know, manipulation. One of the things you do is reference subtractions. So you subtract you know, the time zero. So you look at the relative change. So this is the diffraction of we subtract the reference, look at the you know, relative change. So by converting, again, this uh, reciprocal space distribution to real space by pair distributions, then you look at the, basically the probability of the different bound lengths distribution. And uh, since this ring structure, CHD, have been studied extensively, so for each this uh, high probability, this distance, we can identify what kind of you know, bound distance is corresponding. So this is you know, basically three distribution. We look at the three different distances between the you know, two different uh, you know, atoms. So this is you know, to the first, how we get you know, from the reciprocal space to real space. And the uh, next thing is really to look at the change as a function of time. And this is, again, as you can see, at a different time, you know, minus before the you know, time zero pump laser to break the rings, and the pause days after. So as you can see, with uh, you know, different times, uh, later times, there are certain peaks show up, and a certain peaks disappear. So that means there's a certain distance, for example, this distance increase, that's corresponding ring opening. So basically, by looking at the different time distribution of the distance, we can identify how the structure of this molecule changes with times. And uh, we look at the, at the different time compared with the simulation. As you can see, there's a very good agreement between the simulation and the experiment. So with each time frame, we can look at the bound length change now we can build up uh, basic pictures. And uh, before the 
time zero, and uh, you have ring with uh, about like uh, you know 70 femtosecond, you starting see this uh, ring opening, and uh, so this is the first step, and uh, people have been using optical technique or using electron to indirectly observe the ring opening. We can directly look at this without any simulation, just based on the raw experiment data. We can deduce this is ring. What's more interesting is after ring opening, there's a continue at the ground state, there's a continued dynamics of structure change. So basically we can see, and at the ground state, up to about picosecond, there's still continued evolution of the structure. And this is something other techniques have a difficult to see. So with this kind of, you know, frame by frame pictures, now you basically, you can build, a, you know, so-called molecular movies. And uh, this is a, you know, a simulation. So you have a bound breaking and you have, a, you know, continuous structures. So this is, you know, I'm trying to give you two examples. One is uh, using MEVD to look at the atomic and the ones that look at the molecule, basically you have a bond length change. And uh, lately we have been looking at uh, some more, you know, complex system, for example, CF3I. In these structures, we will be able to distinguish two type process. One is a single photon, one is a two photon process. And uh, this is how we do it because by taking advantage of symmetry, you have a laser polarization we use called parallel perpendicular. So the, you have a parallel mainly related to the single photon process. You have a perpendicular information related to the two photon process. So with UED, basically, we can you know, distinguish this is a you know, single photon, two photon. In the sig single photon process, we mainly observe the bound breaking within like 30 femtosecond. And uh, with uh, you know, two photons, we see a you know, much more complex. Basically, when you have uh, this uh, you know, molecule F, they excite to state, they go through canonical intersection. They split it into two phases. And then they are combined again, come to ground state. So with uh, UED, now we can even study this uh, relative you know, complex systems. And uh, so since I'm running a little bit late, so I want to Go to the next step. So basically, you know, I give you an example with the current MEV UED, what kind of material science and uh, what kind of, uh, you know, chemical ultrafast experiment we can do. You know, I show you this map. So uh, we are continuing to improve the things. One of the things we look at is uh, we are terahertz, the pump. Pump pro. Pump is to determine what kind of physics or chemical you know, process you want to study. So we have been you know, developing tunable sources and the terahertz. Now we are working on the XUV for chemical applications. And the next thing is the sample environment. We have looked at the solid and the warm dense matter. Now we are starting to look at the liquid. So when you do ultra fast, people always try to you know, look at, say, how fast, how short you can do. Now we have 100 femtosecond. People want to look at, for example, water. You need a 10 femtosecond time resolution. So one of the techniques now we are looking at is use terahertz. Basically, because the terahertz are higher frequencies, very similar like a compressor, we are using an accelerator. So the head, you get a deaccelerated, tail, you get an accelerated. So we did some simulations. Basically, you have a terahertz. You can do some modulations. And uh, we can basically produce five femtosecond pulses. So this is a nothing surprise for the using terahertz to generate short pulse. But the one really unique thing is because terahertz is generated by the same laser to generate the electron beam. So if you have a jitters, and so you have a, you know, too early to it, the terahertz cannot can compensate the jitters. So that's one of the advantages using terahertz compared to RF technology, because they are synchronized. So you not only can compress, you can reduce jitters. So that's one of the R&Ds, you know, we are trying to look at this. 
And another you know, program we are looking at is to work on the imaging in the ultra-fast you know, microscopy. So the, one of the areas we look at is uh, to beyond the cryo EMs. As you all know, there's a great success for cryo EM to study the structures. But there's uh, some fundamental limitation in cryo EM, mainly beam reduced the sample movement and the fast back protein movement. So also the sample damage. So basically, we believe with MEV to allow us to go to, you know, secret samples, so you get the integrity of biomolecules, and to overcome this beam-induced and protein, so we can, you know, take a much clearer image. So we propose to develop so-called atomic resolution and sub-nano second temporal resolution ultra-fast MEVs, electron microscope. So one of the, so how are we going to achieve this kind of resolution? Here's our strategies. So we go to high energy, so to reduce space charge. And uh, we look at the bright electron sources. One of the main limitation, you look at the MEV, is the chrom chromatic aberration to limit your spatial resolutions. So you need the stability of your RF system better than 10 to minus five. And uh, so we believe super conducting based on the ISRF gun can achieve, have damage to achieve this uh, 10 to minus five stabilities. And uh, we also, to look at the you know, novel optics, for example, uh, and uh, one of the issues uh, with the current uh, electron microscope, you have uh, many crossovers, the collimation cross, and each crossover is not good to preserve your temporal resolution. So we are looking at the possibility to avoid the crossover, try to you know, reduce the crossover and improve the temporal resolutions. So luckily, we have a, such a device developed at the University of Wisconsin Medicine for free electron lasers, so called quarter wave resonators. And uh, we believe this is a, it's a very good candidate for us to develop, an, you know, superconducting RF gun based on ultra-fast microscope. The reason for that is uh, this is a low frequency, and uh, low frequency behaving like a quasi DCs, so there's uh, no jitter issues. And uh, one of the, another really really important thing is uh, with low frequency, you operating your RF gun at uh, near the field peak. So even with a 40 megawatt per meter, because you operate at 85 degree compared to S-band RF gun, you operate at 30 degree RF gun phase. So this is an equivalent S-band gun's field gradient at 80 megawatt per meters. And because of the red low frequencies, it's less sensitive to the you know, contaminations, to the castles. And uh, also low frequency, we don't have to go, to, we can operate in the whole thing at a 4 case. So this will, you know, give you a great, you know, much engineered simplicity to operating ISRF guns. So this is the technology now being developed at Slack for the ultra-fast electron microscopy. So before I finish, I want to take advantage of this opportunity to thank the support we have received from the DOE you know, basic energy science uh, beside user facility division and uh, accelerator detectors and uh, labs and uh, many, you know, technical from different uh, divisions. And uh, here are some pictures of my colleagues from the different group. And uh, here's uh, some the, the collaborator science in Aaron and uh, Xiaoqi Wu. We work together on the periscope and uh, Martin Thomas, uh, Marcus, um, Tom Martin working on the gas phase. So with this, I stop. I will take a couple questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I had to uh, step away and ask me to uh, uh, be the host for the Q&A uh, session. So any questions for Dr. Wang? Two hundred megahertz. Megahertz. Yeah. So you mentioned that you are going to expand the range of the uh, the pump to cover wavelength or pulse length. Is there any value in having an electron beam as the pump and the probe? So you, you mentioned you know the electron beam has different properties interacting with the system. 
electron beam has different properties interacting with the material, that makes it a valuable probe, but can the electron, a different electron beam, another electron beam, also be the pump? And would that add something new to the experiments? Definitely, there's uh, something, for example, in the uh, pulse radiolysis the chemistry community, they have been using, you know, electron as a pump. And uh, there is a, because to do, use a pump, they need a lot more intensities. And uh, there's definitely certain, you know, physics, uh, but uh, that's a, a more like different uh, subject. Hello. We just have Eric. Uh. With the terahertz, we do. The terahertz compression we use is a terahertz is about like a two, one point, about the peak at point eight terahertz. So with the organic, you know, crystal based terahertz, we can produce about like a three to four terahertz sources. And uh, with that kind of terahertz source, and we believe, we already simulate show we can, you know, fendo second, we can achieve with about like a, you know, couple hundred auto second. But the one of the issue I want to acknowledge, there's a, several groups in Germany and uh, Europe claim, you know, they can use terahertz to generate the auto second pulse. But usually they involve very little electron, usually, you know, single 10 electrons. Here we try to keep at least our pulses about like a thousand electrons so we can, you know, do a useful real experiment. Version. Um, here. You showed uh, a picture of thermal diffuse, diffuse scattering. Yes. Uh, but uh, what is the best resolution you can achieve in terms of energy resolution of the electrons scattered so that you can measure individual phonon branches instead of looking at the diffuse scattering? You can then go to an individual branch and make like inelastic you know, X-ray scattering. So I heard that 10 millivolt is possible, but is what is the limit at the moment in energy resolution? Uh, that's a really good question, and uh, we currently it's uh, not so good on the energy resolution. So I don't recall the exact number. It's uh, not good, but we are basically trying to look at the different frequency and uh, look at the dispersions. So CJ, uh, uh, in your setup right now, you're pulsing at 180 hertz, uh, and with the superconducting gun, you can, in principle, pulse at much higher frequency. What do you see the scientific opportunities of be able to have a much higher rep rate uh, electron beam on your sample? Uh, what does that open up for you? As well, I didn't, you know, because that's a naturally we are. As a matter of fact, we're planning to do is running like a kilohertz to megahertz with the similar gum. The first gum naturally is a gas phase or liquid phase because the sample every shot is naturally replenished, repeat, you know, they're not repeat. So, you know, one of the issues is basically of the heating. So with the gas phase, with the liquid phase, this kind of sample, you know, change, I think is a perfect match. And also with this high rate because uh, now we can go to a relatively uh, lower charge. We can focus it down to, you know, nanometer small size. And uh, that's another area. So one of the things that uh, people have been looking at is the uh, heat seems uh, to the material and they run high rate they don't see any, you know, damage with this high rate. For certain, you know, charge density of material, we do see, you know, when you have a good high rate of heat, you know, change the structures. Uh, change the property of the material. Hi. Um, by comparing uh, pulsed X-ray experiments and pulsed electron experiments, can you imagine exploring the limits of the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? So, sorry. <laughs> so by comparing pulsed X-ray experiments with mm -hmm. the system and pulsed electron experiments, could you explore the range over which the Born-Oppenheimer approximation in theory is applicable so that the electron wave, um, wave packets can be treated independent of the nuclear wave packet? That would be a perfect, uh, you know, since uh, 
we, you know, you want to look at both the electron and the nuclear, you know, change. But uh, you know, once the electron, you you know, you see both, but uh, actually most most sensitive to the electron, you know, exchange. And uh, we, you know, we are more look at the, instead of look at structure, we explore the possibility, look at the spectroscopy technique, use X-ray to look at electron structure, then use the electron to look at the structure. Then we try to put together. That's one of the area we are looking at. Here's a question here in the middle. Um, I was wondering in your uh, experiments with perovskites, uh, it has been shown that the organic component in perovskites has a lot to do with the coupling of oscillation of the organi organic component with the charge transfer in the perovskite cells. Did you measure also uh, the contribution of the organic component in perovskite or not? You know, for electron, we, we, we don't distinguish, but uh, we have another experiment in collaborating with Unira, you know, Abinad, they're using the, you know, high harmonic to look at the, you know, the, the structure change, organic part, and uh, we look at the structure change. There's a paper couplet. I think it just come out uh, last month. I haven't looked at the detail. So there's a paper come out to look at this aspect. Are there any more questions? Last one. Is, is there any application, you know, try to make use of a, any coherence behavior of the electron source? Or maybe the electron source, you know, no coherence, you know, too, too, much, too good to coherence to use. Just like, you know, coherent x-ray, you know. You know, the x-ray coherence is always better than the electron. That's all the challenge for the, you know, People now, as a matter, you look at the electron microscope, they, they use this way played, you know, try to play with the, you know, coherent properties. And uh, currently, you know, we want to, if we want to look at the, you know, larger, larger molecules, we need to improve the coherence. And uh, so we are looking at the several ways uh, by reduce the thermal emittance, basically reduce the emittance by another order magnitude to look at the, now we can look at the, like a couple nanometer size molecules. If we want to look at larger, we need a coherence. That's one of the challenges with uh, electrons. X-rays always have a usually better coherence. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, thanks our speaker again.